Welcome again to the Oracle Data Guard course. In this lecture, we're going to talk about creating a logical standby database. In this lecture, you will learn the following the pros and cons of the logical standby database, how logical standby database can be used in real life. You will also learn about the objects that are not supported in logical standby database. And finally, and most importantly, you will learn the practical procedure that you should follow to create a logical standby database. So, let's get started. As we have discussed before, logical standby database relies on SQL apply to implement the apply service. The process which is responsible to run this service is called logical standby process or LSP. And as you may remember, LSP reads the radio log entries from the standby radio log files, converts them into SQL statements, and then executes them in the database. As we discussed earlier, logical standby database relies on SQL apply for data synchronization, whereas the physical standby database uses radio apply service. The statements that are executed in the primary database, it takes some time to see their effect in the logical standby database. This is because there is extra processing in the standby database side, as the redo entries need to be converted into SQL statements and then executed. Also, you may remember, we have mentioned in the Data Guard Concepts lecture, that the physical structure of the logical standby database is not necessarily the same as the physical structure of the primary database, which means you can create a table space in the logical standby database that doesn't exist in the primary database. Perhaps the best feature in logical standby database is that it allows the database clients to create their objects in the database and perform read-write operations on them. As I have just said, Logical Standby Database allows read-write operations on the user's objects. Furthermore, you can explicitly skip some tables from synchronization. In other words, it provides a flexibility on customizing your application. This option is not there in the Physical Standby Database. Logical Standby Database also provides you the ability to perform rolling upgrade on your data guard configuration databases. This feature reduces the downtime during the upgrade from hours to a few minutes, actually in many cases to a few seconds. On the other hand, Logical Standby Database has some weak points. First of all, not all data types are supported. This means that the tables which have one column or more of the unsupported data types, those tables will not be applied on the logical standby database. They will be shipped to the standby database but not applied into the database. Although this looks like a serious issue, luckily Oracle provides a solution to it. We will cover this solution in a separate lecture of this course. You will learn how to handle the unsupported objects and make them included in your data guard replication. The good news is that in Oracle 12C, data guard has been enhanced to accept more data types than in Oracle versions before 12C. We will list the unsupported data types soon in this lecture. When you plan for creating a logical standby database, Efforts should be made to study the unsupported objects and some code should be executed to handle them. As you will learn in a separate lecture, the steps involved in switching over or failing over to a logical standby database are a little bit more complicated than switching over or failing over to a physical standby database. Another drawback of the logical standby database, it uses SQL apply, which means more processing in performing the apply service. Logical standby database can be practically used for reporting tools, 
performing rolling upgrade or as a staging system to propagate the changes made on the primary database. Logical standby database is specifically useful for BI solution because it allows the BI application to create its own objects like tables or materialized views and this is very common in BI solutions. It also allows the BI software to create indexes on the tables that are replicated from the primary database. If you find yourself in a situation where you want to get advantages of the easy disaster recovery solution provided by the physical standby database and the benefits provided by the logical standby database, remember that you have the option to have both of them. You can create a physical standby database and a logical standby database to obtain the full advantages of the Oracle Data Guard solution. So, what are the objects that are automatically skipped by the logical standby database replication? First, any object owned by an internal schema will not be supported. The view DBA log STDBY underscore skip can be used to obtain a list of internal schemas in the primary database. Secondly, all objects that have unsupported data types will not be supported which means any DML transaction performed on those tables in the primary database side will not be applied in the logical standby database. Thirdly, as a DBA, you can create your own role to skip specific objects from the data guard replication. This might be useful in some cases where you have unnecessary objects in your database that you don't want to include them in your data guard replication. Keep in mind that the RIDO generated by the transactions on the unsupported objects will still be transported to the standby database. They just don't get applied by the SQL apply service. Any table containing any of the following data types will be skipped. P file, row ID or U row ID, all the collections data types like VRA and nested tables, nested tables and refs, the special types shown in the slide, and the identity columns. As I have just said, tables with unsupported data types will not be supported. Also, tables using table compression will be skipped. Again, a redo of unsupported objects will still be transported to the standby database, but they will not be applied in the standby database. All the DDL statements shown in the slide will not be executed in the logical standby database when you run them in the primary database. Therefore, if you use any of them to make configuration changes in the primary database, it will be your responsibility to study its effect on the logical standby database. It could have no effect at all, or depending on the situation, it may need you to manually re-execute it on the logical standby database. Following are the steps you need to carry out before you head on to creating a logical standby database. You need to retrieve the list of unsupported objects in your primary database. You need to study them and get ready to handle those which you need to replicate them in your data guard configuration. You will learn about how to handle unsupported objects in a separate lecture. You also need to study the unsupported schemas and make sure your application doesn't refer to any object owned by any of the unsupported schemas. Furthermore, you need to make sure that all the tables involved in your replication have either a primary key or unique index defined on them. This is important for the logical standby database operation because when it creates the SQL statements, it needs to uniquely identify the rows affected by the statements. Use this view to retrieve list of tables that do not have a unique index defined on them. You need to create primary key constraints on them or unique indexes. Oracle also recommends setting the undo retention initialization parameters to 3600 on both the primary and the logical standby databases. 
The procedure to create a logical standby database is straightforward. You just execute them one after another. You start with creating a physical standby database. That is the first step. If you want to create a logical standby database, you start with creating a physical standby database. In a later step, you will convert it to a logical standby database. Secondly, you make sure the primary database is ready for the role transition. You do that by making some changes on the log archive destination parameters. We will discuss this point in the next slide. Thirdly, you stop the redo apply process. In the fourth step, you build the logminer multi version data dictionary. You do that by simply running the procedure dpms log standby dot build. However, this procedure waits for all existing transactions to complete. Therefore, long running transactions executed on the primary database will affect the timelines of this command. In the fifth step, you will do the magic of converting the physical standby database into a logical standby database. This is easily done by running the command alter database recover to logical standby followed by the unique name of the logical standby database. After that, you mount the database and open it in reset logs option. And finally, you start the SQL apply process. You do that by simply running the command Alter database start logical standby apply immediate. If you have unsupported objects and you have prepared the code to handle them, it is the best time to run your code at this stage. To prepare the primary database for role transitions, you need to set properly the valid for attribute of the log archive destination one parameter. I will explain now why we need to change it and what are the proper settings that we should set for this keyword. Because the logical standby database allows read-write operations, it will have its own online read-log files, whereas the physical standby database does not have online read-log files because it doesn't have read-write operations. Having said that, in the logical standby database case, beside archiving the standby redo log files that it receives, it also should have archiving process for the online redo log files. The default value of the valid for keyword in the log archive destination is all logs, all roles. This means the primary database will store the archived log files of both the received standby redolog files and the online redolog files in the same location, which is of course wrong. That's why in a logical standby database, you need to set the keyword in the parameter to online log files all roles. When you set this setting, you define the archiving location of the online redolog files only and the same location will not be used to archive the standby redolog files. After you define the archiving location of the online redolog files, you should define the archiving location of the standby redolog files. For that, you need a separate log archive destination parameter. The example in the slide is showing a setting example of the parameter log archive destination 3. As you see, the valid for keyword in the code example is set to standby log files, standby role, which means when AuraDB database is running in standby role, it will archive the standby redolog entries into the directory slash arc3 slash AuraDB. So in conclusion, we have log archive destination one to define the location of the archived redolog files of the online redolog files, whereas we use the log archive destination 3 to define the location of the archived log files of the standby redolog files. After completing this lecture, you should have learned to do the following. Describe the benefits and the drawbacks of logical standby database. Describe the usages of using logical standby database in real life. Understand the unsupported objects and data types 
and finally perform the procedure to create a logical standby database. The next lecture is a practice lecture. In that lecture, you will implement the hands-on procedure to create a logical standby database. As in all practices in this course, you don't have to watch the video of the practice lecture to implement the procedure. You can use the practice document, which will be available in the downloadable material of the lecture, to go ahead and implement the procedure straight away yourself. Thanks for watching this video and see you in the next practice lecture.